And it was a very sophisticated methodology that we refer to internally as linky clicky. Yeah, yeah right? Yes. Deal? Doing. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. Welcome to the Acquia Podcast, Drupal Technology, Community and Business. module for that? There, of course there is. We are at Bay Area Drupal Camp 2014. It's amazing. It's at the former um, a location of the Exploratorium, a science museum in San Francisco. So there's all sorts of amazing spaces. There's, it's full of people. We are going to be talking about behavior-driven development. This is John Bicar from Stanford University. Hello. My name is John Bicar. I'm a web developer with Stanford Web Services. We host a self-host a Drupal software as a service platform at Stanford University. We currently have about 1,500 websites on that, and I've been at Stanford for about seven years, a little over seven years, and I've been with Stanford Web Services for over three years now. Stanford Web Services is an in-house Drupal development shop. So we do Drupal site builds for partners on campus. We also host, we're an infrastructure and hosting organization. So we run a software as a service platform that we call Stanford Sites, runs mostly Drupal 7. We started it in Drupal 6 and we maintain this self-service website building platform for anyone at the campus to use for free. We also make much of our code available for free to the campus community and the wider Drupal community. So we have a responsive mobile aware theme based on Twitter bootstrap called open framework that we make available and we make a number of our features and modules available to the wider Stanford community and the wider Drupal community. Well, what are the challenges that Stanford and and higher education are facing today and how are your digital needs changing? It's been interesting to be in the Drupal world for the past seven years because many of the goals that Stanford is trying to accomplish on the web have really changed a lot. In 2007, 2008, mobile was PDA. The iPhone had just come out. It was not, mobile responsive wasn't really widely, wasn't even thought of. A lot of things were using, a lot of sites were doing mobile only with jQuery mobile, et cetera, mobile frameworks. The decision to make a mobile website versus an app was big. And as things have changed, as mobile responsive has come on the scene, as Drupal 7 has come on the scene, and now Drupal 8, we need to continue to respond to changes in technology and changes in communication needs throughout the university. I think one of the major fundamental shifts that we've seen is how people consume the information in different channels, different locations, different modalities, different sizes. Six or seven years ago, we were primarily designing for the desktop. Now it's something like 75% of students consume most of their website content, most of their web content on a mobile device. Don't quote me on that number, that percentage, but it's a very high percentage. And that information, there's a, there's a much higher demand for information that's available in multiple modalities all the time, 24-7, 365. What is behavior-driven development and how are you implementing it? Behavior-driven development is a process by which you define your user stories and your business values based on what a user of the website wants to get done and why it matters to them. Behavior-driven development then allows you to write those steps down in plain English and you can then use that to build towards complete. So when those user scenarios and those features are complete and testable, then you have, you know that you're finished. This is the, the way I understand the, the pure definition of behavior-driven development. We've only been using behavior-driven development and BHAT for about six months. So we really came into it, we came into BHAT as a way to do functional testing, but we've really started to adapt the behavior-driven development part because it allows us to get everyone participated and get everyone involved in writing the user stories and in 
creating the business value and agreeing on the business value. And then the developers, we know what we're building towards. We care about delivering websites that work to our clients. And we care about partnering with our the various stakeholders on campus and delivering cutting edge communications. What that means is it needs to be always up. It needs to deliver the information that they need. Behavior driven development is a way that we can meet that in a rapid and accurate manner. There are a number of ways that we use behavior driven development to deliver better software. We use tools that are part of the behavior driven development toolkit to ensure stability when we make changes to code. So at heart, the function of what I do is I'm a software developer, but no one cares about the code that I write and I can't blame them. They care about whether or not they can do the things that they came to a website to do. So if I go to my investment broker's website and I'm trying to buy stocks and I can't buy stocks because they've rolled out new features and functionality. They failed at their at their jobs. They failed at their tasks. So similarly, when we push out code updates as a software developer, we use tools like Behat and Mink, which are part of the behavior driven development toolkit to ensure that the business value, that the things that the users want to do remain intact when we push those. It's incredibly valuable because it allows us as software developers to completely refactor the code underneath and ensure that the functionality of the website still remains intact. Talk about implementing automation into your into your workflows and, and what you're getting out of that. We started getting I started getting interested in Behat after seeing some presentations on it at the last two Drupal cons and I attempted had a couple of aborted attempts to get it up and running. Finally put some time into it, got it up and running, got some sample tests written and run, showed it to the rest of my team, and it was like the wool had been pulled over their eyes. Everyone immediately saw how valuable this could be because our method of QA when we would launch a website used to be literally click through the top level navigation, click through the sidebar navigation, and it was a very sophisticated methodology that we refer to internally as Linky Clicky. Linky Clicky was not sustainable and so our ability to automate rote tasks and check for navigation elements, check for functional elements has completely transformed the way that we work because it allows us to focus on building things that matter and not spend time doing QA on things that should just still be working. We have a line of products for the university that are that that we call Stanford Sites Jumpstart. So it's a set of Drupal installation profiles that come with default content, default menu structure, default layouts, roles, things that people should do. There's Stanford Sites Jumpstart all the way up to Stanford Sites Jumpstart Academic, which is a full out of the box installation profile for an academic website. So as you can imagine, in these installation profiles, there are, cert there are certain things that people should be able to do in various roles. So as a small example, one of the features that we just rolled out was the ability for site owners to go in and change the layout of the homepage. So we have a few predefined blocks that are placed in different regions on the homepage, and we want the site owner to be able to move those around and we built a user interface for those. So an example of a scenario that we wrote to test this is as a site owner, I should be able to, as a site owner, I want to change the layout of my homepage so that I can respond to varying needs of communication within my department. And one of the scenarios that would be written along those lines is, Given that I am logged in as a user with the site owner role and I am on the customized design page, when I click the select button for the Lomita homepage layout, I should see the selected options have been changed. And when I'm on the homepage, I should see this element in this region, this element in that region, this element in that region. So that's testing for the blocks being in the correct configuration. And then given that I'm logged in as a user with the editor role and I am on the customized design page, I should see you do not have access to this functionality. So we're currently on version 4X of our Stanford Jumpstart line of products, which means that we have reiterated and rebuilt this 
four times now. And each time we restructure things, it is a monumental undertaking, excuse me, it has been a monumental undertaking to make sure that we haven't broken pre-existing functionality that users have come to expect. Now that we have tests written for this and we've made the business value explicit for these operations, we can refactor the underlying code to fit what the developers need and fit what the project managers need and what the web services team needs and still provide the same user experience to the end users of, to the end users of the product. What was Drupal Geddon and how did it affect you and your organization? Drupal Geddon was a wide scale SQL injection vulnerability in the Drupal content management system. What does that mean? That means that all websites hosted on Drupal 7, created with Drupal 7, as of 9 a.m. on the morning of October 15th, 9 a.m. Pacific time, had a severe security vulnerability that could be exploited from anyone in the world. What this meant for Stanford University is that all of a sudden we had easily over 1,500 websites that were vulnerable to this security vulnerability. On October 14th, we had a bit of advance warning that there was going to be a major security update the following day on October 15th. The news in the tech world was that there was a vulnerability in SSL, the protocol that is used to connect securely with websites and with other secure communications across networks. We expected that this was going to be the vulnerability. On the morning of October 15th, we learned that it was an SQL injection vulnerability in Drupal core itself, not related to the SSL vulnerability, which has been termed Poodle. So we rapidly, when the announcement came out that Drupal 7.32 was released that patched the upgrade, our, our team scrambled to assess what the vulnerability was, determine if it affected us, if it applied to our situation, determined, tried to determine the scope of how it could impact the websites that were under our purview, and determine a course of action. So we reviewed the patch, it was a very small patch, it was one line, and looked at ways and analyzed ways that this change could affect our product. So we have over 1,400 websites on Stanford sites that are in Drupal 7, and we have, I think we're using around 100 contributed modules. And so this was a change to the database layer. So we very quickly analyzed and came up with a few situations or things that could be affected, particularly function calls that could be affected. And this is a little bit of Drupal speak, but it was DB insert calls and did a quick run through the code base and saw that a lot of contributed modules use that function call. So we had a good idea of the base of contributed modules that could be affected. Fortunately, we had a broad suite of BHAT tests, functional tests for all of those modules. So we were able to run those tests in about 30 minutes against a testing environment that had been upgraded to Drupal 732. All of those tests passed and so we could communicate to the infrastructure team that this was a change that needed to be made on an emergency basis that same day. We had deployed the test to a testing environment. We had deployed the update to a testing environment. We had tested it and we had full confidence that it could be rolled out without any user facing impact. What it gave us was a huge degree of confidence that we could roll this update out and it would not cause any regression errors. We don't have full test coverage. We have focused on providing coverage on the things that are the most valuable, the things that make the most sense or that mean the most. And so despite not having complete test coverage, we have enough that we could with confidence say we can roll this patch out and it's a, it's a risk analysis situation and the clock is ticking. So do we wait and test more or do we roll out with 95% certainty and say we're certain, we're relatively certain that this isn't going to break anything and it is severe enough and important enough that we need to roll this out right away. And without the test coverage that we had, it would have been probably days before we were able to get that patch rolled out. 
everyone has swallowed the B hat pill on my team. So we have the, I think the second day we have a new intern this fall. And I think her second day on the job, I had her writing B hat tests, running B hat tests, committing those tests in Git and pushing up a branch of her test of her test to the repo on GitHub. So it was a fire hose of information to come at her, but she rolled with it. She immediately saw the value. And that was a really enlightening moment for me to see an intern who knew honestly very little about the totality of the work that we do to immediately see the value of this type of work. When I first showed it to the rest of my team, again, it was a similarly enlightening moment that everyone saw that we could automate a lot of the things that we were doing manually and remove the human element and remove the human error because when you're manually clicking through you miss things and if we could define those tests in a very programmatic way and run them in a very programmatic way all of a sudden we now can focus on delivering better software delivering it faster and knowing that it is delivering the value that we've promised to our partners. Zach Chandler and I have been co-workers for colleagues for over seven years, and I've been fortunate to work with him at Stanford Web Services for the last three plus years. Anything that I say on camera about Zach Chandler, I would say to his face. <laughs> hey, Zach.